If it had been a heart attack, the newspaper might have used the word massive, as if a mountain range had opened inside her. But instead, it used the word suddenly, a light coming on in an empty room. The telephone fell from my shoulder, a black parrot repeating, something happened, something awful, a Sunday, dusky. If it had been terminal, we could have cradled her as she grew smaller, wiped her mouth, said goodbye. But it was sudden, how overnight we could be orphaned, and the world become a bell we'd crawl inside, and the ringing all we'd eat. I want to start with that, because um, later in the reading, you'll hear an echo of that last line. Um, so you'll see that I steal liberally from myself. <clears throat> now I want to do, from my, I have a book coming out in the spring, um, uh, a new book of poems, and I want to read a poem from that book. This is from my daughter. It's called Father Insect. And now since you, you read a poem about your mother and you don't wear your glasses, then you read one about your daughter and you put in your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Something, I'm uh, talking to a therapist about that. <laughs> Father Insect. After her bath, as a way to apologize for all my imperfections, I remind my daughter, you know, before you were born, I was not a father. She takes this in silently, moving a tiny blue elephant across the rug. If you weren't a father, she eventually asks, then what were you, a bug? We've been looking at pictures of cavemen, talking about evolution, about where we came from, about all those who came before. Are they us, she asks. I tell her about the carbon in her pencil, about hydrogen bonding with oxygen, about bacteria with only one thought in their tiny heads. She uses her finger to write it all out in the air, creating each word as I speak it. When did want become more than hunger? When did need become more than shadow? Ecclesiastes warns about the making of books, of which there is no end. This chain of meaning, this offering, the book we both were right, today, into today, into today. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to jump to, um, to jump back now to uh, another bullshit night in Suck City, which I'm very grateful that, um, that the uh, university was brave enough to put the title in its entirety on its posters. It doesn't always happen. Often I get a lot of asterisks. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I mean, if you can't do it in Texas, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I expected the New York Times to do that, but I, didn't, I wouldn't expect it in Texas. Um, so, yeah, I'll just read, I'll read a thing and I'll tell you what the book's about. It's called uh, Ulysses. Many fathers are gone. Some leave, some are left, some return unknown and hungry. Only the dog remembers. Even if around, most disappear all day to jobs their children only slightly understand. Gone to office, gone to shop, men in suits hiding behind closed doors, yelling into phones, men in coveralls reading pornography in pickup trucks. The carpenter, the electrician, they drive to strangers' houses. A woman in a robe answers the door. They sit at the table with her. She offers coffee and cake. They talk about the day ahead. By nightfall, you won't recognize the bathroom, he promises. Monday, we start in on the roof. Many end up sitting around the house all day, sneaking sips in the woodshed. Many drive to other towns, make love to a woman they've been making love to for years. Some continue to yell at their sons from the grave. Some are less than a tattered photograph. Some sons need to exhume the body. Some see, need to see a name written in a ledger. Some drive past the house the father once lived in as a child, park across from it. Some swear that if they could gaze into his face just once, their hearts would settle. One friend inherited some money and hired a private investigator to track down his lost father, paid a thousand dollars to find out his father was dead. All my life, my father had been manifest as an absence, a non-presence, a name without a body. The three of us sat around the table, my mother, brother, and I, all carrying his name. 
Some part of me knew he would show up, that if I stood in one place long enough, he would find me, like you're taught to do when you're lost. But they never taught us what to do if both of you are lost, and you both end up in the same place, waiting. So that place for me, um, the book is, uh, uh, chronicles my 20s, where I worked at a homeless shelter in Boston. Um, maybe some of you know this. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I worked there for three years, and after three years, my father, who I didn't know, who I didn't grow up with, got evicted from where he lived and ended up being on the streets for five years. And the book chronicles how he ended up at the shelter and how my life and his life intersected, and we both ended up in the same place at the same time. So, I'd like to read a poem that I did. I tried to write it as, as poetry first. Um, this, uh, what was happening, and then I, this is from my first book again. And somehow I, I had to write the, the memoir afterwards, uh, <clears throat> just because I, I mean I liked the poem, but it, it, it didn't seem to. It probably says everything that the book says, and it's much shorter. So if you just want to read one poem, <laughs> and then I wrote a whole book basically which says the same thing as the poem says. Father outside. A black river flows down the center of each page, and on either side the banks are wrapped in snow. My father is ink falling in tiny blossoms, a bottle wrapped in a paper bag. I want to believe that if I get the story right, we will rise, newly formed, that I will stand over him again as he sleeps outside under the church halogen. Only this time I will know what to say. It is night, and it's snowing, and starlings fill the trees above us. So many, it seems, the leaves sing. I can't see them until they rise together at some hidden signal and hold the shape of the tree for a moment before scattering. I wait for his breath to lift his blanket, to know he's alive, letting the story settle into the shape of this city. Three girls in the park begin to sing something holy, a song with a lost room inside it, as their prayer book comes unglued and scatters. I'll bend each finger back until the bottle falls, until the bone snaps, save him by destroying his hands. With the thaw, the river will rise and he will be forced to higher ground. No one will have to tell him. From my roof, I can see the East River. It looks blackened with oil, but it's only the light. Even now, my father is asleep somewhere. If I followed the river north, I could still reach him. So, I wanted to read that one. Um, Jeff, it's so nice to be in a place where you just can call everyone Jeff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, makes, it makes my life so much easier. <laughs> Having just met everyone. <laughs> I'm gonna remember this town as a town. Jeff's. <laughs> <laughs> and if, you, if you, anyone wants me to sign their book, I'm only going to sign it to Jeff. <laughs> um, so I wanted to read that. I was, uh, Je Jeff saw me putting this together, the reading together, in his office a minute ago, just before I came in. And I was just thinking, you know, what the crowd, I like to sort of see the room and breathe the air a little bit um, of the town I'm in. Uh, I have been to Victoria before. Um, uh, I have some friends that have a place here. Uh, and, uh, so I knew the town a little bit. But uh, I didn't know you guys. So I thought, so we had a camera watching you guys when I was putting the reading together as people came in. I'm just kidding about the camera. So. <laughs> but I wanted to read this since you were, I figured you were all writers or, or students thinking about writing uh, in some way or writers. Uh, I wanted to sort of show again how I steal for myself. So this is um, that last poem I read, The Father Outside. Uh, I don't know how many years later, five, six years later. Um, this five, four years later, this book came out. And uh, I took one of those images from that poem, which you'll probably hear the echo of in this. This is just the last part of uh, uh, a chapter called um, How's My Driving? But I'm just going to read the very end so you can hear the echo. And this is when I'm, I'm driving a van in, a, in Boston, a homeless van, a, a, called an outreach van, so we'd see people that wouldn't stay inside the shelters. Uh, and I did this for sort of the last part of my years there. I did it so my father was living in the shelter, and I did it so I wouldn't have to encounter my father in the shelter. 
And then he, in his, in his way, he got himself barred from the shelter, so he ended up living outside. So then I ended up seeing him again every day. <clears throat> Later, I'll stand over my father as he sleeps under the church halogen. Impossible light. Jeff stays in the van, lets me do this alone. Snow dusts his blanket, his eyebrows, the bag tied to his wrist like a tourniquet. Barred now, now nowhere inside for him to go. Now every night I could find him. Starlings fill the trees above us. Isn't it late for starlings? Don't they fly south? His chest rises and falls, tiny cracks in the dusting of snow, miniature avalanches, a distant rumble. The halogen's hum fills the sphere of light I inhabit. I cannot remember a way out of this sphere. He breathes in this hum. I breathe in his hum. If his chest still rises, if his blankets seem adequate, then I won't enter this building he has built. If I step into the lobby of his chest, I will sink up to my knees in nothing. I will lose my feet, like traversing a swamp. We had gardeners and chauffeurs growing up, he says. When this is over, I'll be sleeping inside the Ritz, where I belong. I stand on the sidewalk, searching my pockets for the key, embedded in the asphalt below my feet. What does it feel like? Whose filthy body? How far to the palace? <clears throat> yeah, so I wanted to read that just to show that, to give you permission to steal from yourself. You can steal from me too if you want to. I probably won't sue you. <laughs> probably not. I'll read one more from, uh, from this book. Time. This is called the, the Piss of God. This, this is the only other curse word in the whole book, except for the title. I thought I was being very honest, putting all the profanity right on the cover. Because you read some books that have these really sweet titles, like Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot to read in this book. <laughs> From what I understand, I haven't actually cracked it. The Piss of God. Sometimes a man falls asleep in the midst of buttoning his jacket, his fingers hanging on to the last button. Sometimes embedded in hot asphalt, you see a key shined by the soles of pedestrian shoes. You check your pockets, suddenly worried. The sidewalk calls, using the trick of gravity to bring you to your knees, to close your eyes, to make you sleep. If there's grass, if you can see it, each blade catches a sliver of streetlights. Each blade wants you to hold on. Face down, you swear you can feel the earth spin. Hold tight or you'll spin off into outer space. Forget about ceilings, about walls, about doors, about keys. The bread you ate at lunch is already turning to soil inside you. Night soil now, darkness hovering inside. Soon your flesh will crumble off you. Those on their way to work the next morning will pass your whitened skeleton like so many styrofoam cups, bleached, perfect. If not for the rats, you could crawl beneath a bush, a bush, a bench, a bridge, the alliterative universe. Rats, too, can pass through that needle's eye to enter heaven as easily as they pass into a box imagined into a house. Houses inside buildings, houses inside tunnels. Some exist for only a day, some miraculously longer. This box held a refrigerator. The refrigerator is in an apartment. A man is in the box. Tomorrow, the box will be flattened and tossed. You've seen the garbage men stomping them down to fit into the truck. Wake up in the grass, soaking wet. Dew is the piss of God. Another bullshit night in Suck City, my father mutters. And then there's the Celtics, losing just across town. Last night, Mackie had a lazy boy set up in Rat Alley, watching a television hotwired into a light pole. My father stepped into Mackie's living room, checked out a couple minutes of play. Can he still be called the glory days of Bird? Step out of your room. Settle into a discarded recliner. Are you inside now or out? Position your chair before your television. Take your walk, find your coffee. By morning, it will all be gone. No inside, no outside, no cardboard box, no mansion, no birth, no death, no container, no contained, a zen koan, a frickin' riddle. <clears throat> a garbage truck hauled the TV away. Another will be put out on the sidewalk tonight. But a lazy boy might board.
maybe not again in this lifetime. <clears throat> you know, I could have said, and then there's the Celtics winning just across town. <laughs> but, you know, it goes over better in Texas if I say losing. <laughs> Although we did win a lot. Not to rub it in. <clears throat> but we can talk about that later. When I'm signing your books, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to shift to this new book now um, uh, called The Reenactments. What is this? That's not the right thing at all. So The Reenactments, as, um, as Jeff said in the introduction, is, uh, you know, I wrote this book, Another Bullshit Night in Sex City, and then uh, it got optioned to be made into a film, and it took uh, it took seven years to get greenlit, you know, to get, to get uh, for the money to flow, which <coughs> seems surprising because you, you think Hollywood would just, you know, flock to a, a film about a homeless street alcoholic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, and it did. It got, it, it, you know, I worked with Paul Weitz, and uh, I think the time was actually good those seven years because uh, Paul wrote th uh, thirty drafts of the. Of the script, and he showed them all to me, and we sort of went back and forth a lot, and, um, and then, it, then it, you know, it came together. And I was on set every day for the, the seven weeks of the shoot, and I, there's a lot of time on, on when you're on a, a shoot of a film. It turns out it's not actually that exciting. Um, uh, there's a lot of boring things, and uh, so I had a lot of time to write. Uh, so that's what I did. And this is this is a little. Um, I'm going to just sort of do, do one thread from the book. Uh, Julianne, and it is Julianne Moore, who played my mother. <clears throat> I'm on the phone with Julianne. A month or so we start filming. We're on speakerphone with Paul. They are, well, I don't know where they are. I imagine a hotel room, maybe a restaurant, just voices without bodies, asking questions about my mother. I say hi to Julianne, say how happy I am she is involved, that I look forward to meeting her. Paul says, do you have time to talk? I'm outside a bike shop, about to buy a bike. Mine was recently stolen. I have time. So your mother shot herself, he asks. I didn't just make that up, did I? No, you didn't make that up. Where'd she get the gun, he asks. We had lots of guns around my house, I tell him. Some antique ones hung on the wall, a working shotgun in a zippered bag in the closet, the shells in my mother's top drawer. I sometimes put them in the gun when she wasn't around, but I don't tell Paul this, nor do I tell Julianne. I don't know why I don't tell them. Maybe because my mother didn't know. At least I thought she didn't know. So Julianne doesn't need to know. Or maybe she knows already. I tell them she had her own pistol. A 38, which she got a permit for in 1972. I'd go target shooting with her, and then later I'd shoot a rifle with my stepfather, the Vietnam vet, and then some other guns with my friends who were into guns. Guns, motorcycles, and beer. I like, I like the motorcycles and the beer, though I wasn't that into the guns. I tell them that after she died, the cops came and took all the guns away, confiscated them, that I never went to retrieve them. <clears throat> That last line probably reads differently in Texas than it does in New York. In New York, everyone just nods, nods sagely, like, of course you didn't retrieve them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just realizing maybe you don't feel the same way. <laughs> on, the phone, on the phone, Julianne asked, so it's hard for me to hear about pills. Which pills did your mother take? I tell her about the Darvon, which I don't even know if they still make, but I believe it was a barbiturate, a knockout pill, a down. She took them for her migraines. Julianne says, oh, my mother had migraines too, and I say, oh. How old was your mother when she had you, Julianne asks, and I say she was 20, 21, and Julianne says, my mother was 20 when she had me, and I say, oh, yes, so you know. But even as I say the words, I don't know what they mean. She asks about her depression, and I say, it was mostly just when she had migraines that she'd go inside, that she'd spend a day in bed, that otherwise 
she was vivacious, young, alive. She made it to work every day, and then she went to her other job at night. She didn't miss work until maybe near the end, when she started doing cocaine and things got a little sloppy. Everyone was doing cocaine then, I add, and Julianne laughs. She got a little off the rails, but not so far off. I'm leaning over a wrought iron railing, looking into a restaurant. A Chinese man comes to the window, looks up at me. Julianne is now in the bathroom. Paul comes up as I watch the screen, but all I can see is the way the light is caught on the tiles behind her. Julianne simply sits there on the toilet, her painkillers balanced on the sink beside her. She stares at the orange pill bottle. She must have stared at it before she struggled off the childproof cap, before she dumped out the white capsules, before she put them inside her. A month ago on the phone, I told Julianne that my mother was for her headaches. Today she told me that her mother would take furanol. Yes, that's it. That's what she took. I'd forgotten the word. Maybe she took both. She took a lot. The furanol. It sounds like a species of orchid. It sounds like a glass flower we forgot to make. Action. I never went to the police station to retrieve my mother's guns. For all I know, they're still locked in a room somewhere. Or else one day they were auctioned off. Or else they simply vanished. Maybe someone uses one of them every year, the shotgun, to shoot a deer, to feed his family. Or maybe someone used the other one, the same one my mother used, the 38, to end his or her life. Maybe I should have retrieved them, melted them down. I could have forged them into something, an urn, something big enough to sleep in, and the world become a bell we'd crawl inside, and the ringing all we'd eat. <clears throat> There will be a quiz about where I got that last line <laughs> during the question and answer period. Um, so I'm going to end with um, a few poems from this new book uh, of poems, if that's okay. Anyone have any questions now? Any students have any questions before you go? If you have to run off, you could, this would be a moment to ask a question. I know some of you have to leave in 10 minutes. Feel free to jump in. Don't be all weirdly polite. Nothing? Okay. Okay, I'll read some poems. This is called Incomprehensibility. Uh, there's, a, there's a movie out right now called uh, Birdman. Maybe some of you have seen it. Uh, and it's actually getting all this attention for Academy Awards and stuff, but it's actually not even like the good movie by this director, Interview 2. The good movie was the one he made before this called uh, Beautiful. That's a really fantastic movie. The, you know, Birdman's good, it's just pretty good. Uh, beautiful is amazing. So this, this takes an image from uh, Beautiful and for the first stanza or so, called Incomprehensibility. The newly dead hung under the ceiling last night like moths wanting to tell us what they hadn't found words for yet, their bodies still warm on their mattresses below. They did not look comfortable passing themselves on the way out. Only mystery allows us to live. Lorca wrote this in the back of one of his many drawings of a sailor, or of many sailors. Only mystery, and yet or so, I pull myself back again to a place wherein I can comprehend, if only a glimmer, the moment my mother will press a bullet into the chamber of her 38. Think of Fra Angelico's enunciation. Nothing has happened, not yet. Mary's back is to the angel. His hand hovers over her shoulder, not touching her, not yet. It's still not too late to turn back. A Sunday morning, we can hear the ocean. We can smell it. If we could get up, we could even see it. Junkies can go to a clinic in downtown Vancouver now to shoot up in safety. We can help them find the vein, the pretty nurse says, but we cannot depress the plunger. As I write this, a Boeing 777, along with all 239 souls on board, vanishes from the sky. No distress call, no black box, no wreckage. By the time you read this, we will all know what happened. Wormhole, drunk pilot, we actually have no idea. But right now, it is simply gone. Let's look again at the Annunciation. Let's think of the angel as a pretty nurse. Let's think of her wings as possibility, her silence as a syringe. 
Let's put my mother in that airplane now. Let's let her circle forever. Let's imagine she too is unable to land. She glances out the window, sometimes at the tops of the clouds, sometimes at someone's sad house below. I know you're still in there, she whispers, raising one finger. Poke a hole through the heavy curtains, she mouths. You'll see they're not even real. And then I'll just finish with this one poem. Um, another, for some reason, uh, poem based on a movie. Uh, there was a movie came out, it's called, the poem's called Gravity. And, uh, I'll read two poems, I'll see how much time we have. Um, which probably a lot of you saw also. I have no idea how to find this poem. This book is not out yet, so I don't really know this book very well. There it is. <coughs> Uh, Gravity, uh, you probably all know that, that movie. Yeah, don't have to say it. But there's a, the year this came out, it came out like last year. And uh, it seemed like every movie I saw had the exact same script. It was amazing. Uh, <laughs> it was about like some individual alone in a very small space, like having terrible things happen. There's the one with Tom Hanks on a boat with pirates and, yeah, Captain Phillips. And then uh, Gravity, and then, then uh, Robert Redford on a sailboat. And, Things that happened. It was all the same script. If you looked at it, it was the exact same. Because they never said anything, they didn't speak. <laughs> <laughs> this one, so this is Gravity. Five days. I bring myself to movies in the middle of the day. Today is, is about an astronaut, that's all I know, all I want to know. I put on the glasses that make the world real, and soon the world is outer space. It starts with a view of the Earth, snow over oceans, brown land. All our thoughts from this. A space capsule drifting in the darkness, some voices. So what do you like about being up here, a man asks. A woman answers, the silence. I could get used to the silence. For the past five days, the phone has rung and it's still dark when I am still sleeping. Your father is in the hospital, one of the Creole women who takes care of him says, in her beautiful lilt. Soon the astronauts, who are really little more than their voices, are caught in the debris of an exploded satellite, and everything falls away from them. Their spaceship, the Earth, each other. We can make him comfortable, the doctor says, if that's what you decide. I ask what pills he is on, and she lists many, many pills. To keep the depression out of his spacesuit, she says. Meat. Today, as if answering a question only she could hear, my daughter declared, I know what little boys are made of. Little boys are made of meat. She looks into my mouth sometimes, says she wants silver teeth like mine. Why are your teeth silver, she asks. I want to tell her that there were a few years when I wasn't sure I wanted to be on the planet, until one by one my teeth left me. Diamonds. That astronaut, when she finally decided to live, her tears floated around our heads like diamonds. My favorite part, and I forgot it until just now. <laughs>